so much more than a university does. And one of the most important things we do is research. And I don't think there are many more eminent researchers than uh, Professor Colin Pritchard. Colin, who's joining us tonight. Um, <coughs> he's started out as a social worker. Um, he worked for 15 years as a social worker. He ended up as a principal psychiatric social worker. And he then moved into academia. And I think it's safe to say his career really hasn't looked back since then. Um, he's held posts at Leeds, Bath, now Bournemouth, where he's research professor in psychiatric social work. Um, and he's also a visiting professor and emeritus professor at a minor institution called Southampton down the road. Um, you may have heard of it. Uh, and as you can see from the flyer tonight, if you've seen the flyer, he has, over his years in academia, picked up a very impressive list of initials after his name. Um, which are, we've got, yes, many of them there, you can see them all there. Uh, and he's also recently been appointed to the board for the Surgical Neurology International, um, which is a major, a major accolade for anyone to be uh, put onto that board. Um, and he's also, he must be one of the university's most published professors, if not one of, it's probably the most published professor. So um, a great honor um, to be able to introduce him to you tonight. Um, <clears throat> he's also worked with the PR team on many features, and was most recently featured in the Sunday Times, um, which is, again is fantastic. The form of university's research is featured in the Sunday Times. So great for us and the communications team to work with him because he's got such a good impact. Uh, which leads me on to the other role of the university. Uh, and the reason that we're all here tonight, and thank you again for coming, that is the societal impact of our research. Um, a university cannot work alone. We're not some on a power, ivory tower working alone. Uh, we need to work with society on the issues that affect us all. Uh, and there aren't many more issues that can have more importance than the subject Colin is going to talk to us about tonight. Uh, the title is The Scandal of Poverty and Child Mortality in the Western World. Are British Children Especially Disadvantaged? Is that right? Yeah. More or less, yes. Right. More or less. Okay. Well, yes. and, uh, um, and the point of this evening is to generate debate. Um, I appreciate this is a, a incredibly chunky, meaty subject. It's not an easy subject, um, but we don't work alone, and we want your participation. That's the point of tonight. That's why we're here. We want your participation, so please do join in. Um, I've got a big caveat that these are difficult subjects. As it says on the uh, flyer, uh, this, evident reports, this event reports the evidence, even if it might offend. So a bit of um, advisory. If you're easily offended, probably not the evening for you. Um, so, so please bear that in mind, um, that we are covering some fairly weighty subjects tonight. Um, now then, this one here. Uh, Colin's going to further outline how the evening will go, but uh, before I introduce him, a few other things to point out. Um, this is not a traditional lecture. Colin is going to talk for 30 or so minutes, interrupt him at any time. Uh, if you've got a point or a question, do interrupt him. This isn't him lecturing from on high, this is a debate. This is a discussion. He's laying some, some facts for you. Please do challenge them and, and discuss them with them. We're going to have a break for drinks. Um, and I do really, really, really want to emphasize, please do have drinks, do. It's all delicious. It's all fantastic. Um, so please do do that. And then we're going to reconvene. And Colin's going to then present the final couple of slides. Is that right? Um, for the final bit of debate. So please do, do interact. Um, we want to share this evening. Uh, so we will be taking pictures and video. If you've got any issues with that, um, the subject's fine, obviously. Please do let one of the BU team know, and we'll make sure that you're not featured in any video or pictures. So we've got BU team. Lift their hands. Emily! Uh, thank you. Uh, anyway, moving on. <laughs> uh, 
We would also like to a view share this evening, so do crack on to our Twitter and uh, social media accounts. Uh, the address is Cafe Sidema. The right at Cafe Sidema, and the hashtag is Cafe Sidema. And so uh, different ones there. Um, finally, I'd like to very much thank Cafe Bosconova for hosting us this evening. Thank you very much, Cafe Bosconova. Uh, please do take advantage of some of the fantastic drinks and food they have available. Uh, now, uh, let me get away. And introduce uh, <laughs> Professor Colin Pritchard to talk about his subject. Oh, wow, uh, we're obviously going to be disappointed. Um, yeah, what I would emphasize is we're going to deal with some fairly heavy issues, and you're going to be presented with a lot of numbers. Now, I can, we could spend a lot of time talking about how we come to these numbers and the method of doing the research, etc. But rather than do that, I'd very happily send you a copy of the main paper, which is going to be published next month in uh, Christian Wallace, in this case. And it's in, uh, you can just email me at colinpritchard at bournemouth.ac.uk. Very happy to send you the paper. The only thing is, and this is the problem about research, the paper will be published, on, it's actually online now, but it only takes the data up to 2008. And what drove me mad only the last week in July, the World Health Organization updated all its recent mortality statistics. Sorry, I couldn't have had that drink. Um, <laughs> and which means, of course, that these figures are the most up-to-date possible in the Western world today. Um, all the data on the deaths come from the World Health Organization. And I would say, rather than let me wrap it on, is anything is unclear, you don't understand, that's my fault. If you let me wrap it on and you don't know what I've been talking about, then we share the thing. So please don't hesitate. Put your hand up because I'm deaf in one ear and say, Colin, can you explain that? Or Colin, I don't agree, so don't hesitate. Let's talk. Um, in the last analysis, child mortality rates are an indication of how well a nation meets the needs of its children. That's said by the UNICEF in 2001. So the question tonight is, Colin, comparatively, how well does the UK meet the needs of its children? If a parent fails to meet the needs of its children, we call it a neglecting parent. And, you know, we have social services, we have the child protection, and you have high-status high cases, and, you know, baby P, Victoria Klimberly, etc. The question is, if a nation relatively, comparatively, fails its children, is this an indicator of a nation politically and socially neglecting, failing its children? A little background. I've lost a husband, mother and father, brothers and sisters, but nothing, nothing is more bitter than losing a bairn, a child. As a father and a grandfather, the nightmare of every parent in this room is the fact that the child might predecease you, die before you. I can't think of anything worse in life. I'll be honest. So, whilst we're going to be talking about figures, I want you to remember that the figures we're talking about are children who have died. World Health Organization, the CMR, child mortality rate. But I want to put them in a context. Because, you know, the world we live in has got many different facets. And one is relative poverty. I have a feeling, those of you under 30 in this room, I probably get two or three times more than you do. But I don't think you're poor, because A, the fact you're here, you've got an inquiring mind, life is wonderful, and life is before you. So what is relative poverty? You can measure it by all sorts of ways. But in cruel fact, it's about the difference between the top 20% of the population and the bottom 20% of the population. Now, I'm not going to apologise for my salary, because, as you say, I've got a lot of letters, and I've put the hours in. And, of course, we do have some of you studying for degrees, and you want to be where I am later on, etc. But bearing in mind that the current average salary, average salary in Britain today, 
is £27,000 a year. But 60% of the population are on less than £18,000 a year. So what you're really seeing is this average means very little. Because the majority of people are well below the average. And this poverty, the gap between the top and the bottom, is serious. Health expenditure. And of course, we're talking about child mortality rates. So what stops children dying? Well, all sorts of things, society, etc. But crucially, what you and I, the nation, spend on our health care. Medicine is essentially about reducing death. In the last analysis, the key outcome measure is have we reduced deaths? And tonight we're talking about reducing children's deaths. So health expenditure, that, <coughs> we measure that by looking at the gross domestic product. That's the nation's wealth. How much of the nation's wealth do we devote to health care, your NHS? And what we'll be looking at later is cost effectiveness. Any economists here? Well, that's all right, then good, I can get away with it. A cost effectiveness is we're looking at the reduced death level, because deaths have come down, you'd be pleased to know, but how much did it cost? So we, what we divide, we look at the number of reduced deaths, the deaths we, lives we save, divided by the money we spend on health. That's cost effectiveness. So hopefully that will be fairly straightforward. 21 Western world countries, starting with Austria, Austria, Australia, ending up with the UK and the USA. We include Japan because Japan has been a democratic society and liberal society, and most uh, international researchers include Japan as part of the Western world. So these are the 21 Western world countries. We don't include Latin America for the uh, uh, former Warsaw Pact countries, or Asia, or India, or Africa, but for the obvious political and socio-economic reasons. Um, relative poverty. Don't forget, it's the top 20% compared with the bottom 20%. And God bless America, top of the league table again. They're always top of the league table, are the Americans. And in America, their income inequality is eight and a half times. So the top 20% get eight and a half times, Mr. Chairman, than the bottom 20%. Now, can you imagine what the top 1% must be getting compared with the bottom 5%? Incredible. Then comes Portugal, A time, and then, A, eh, the United Kingdom. Can it really be true the United Kingdom has got the third worst relative poverty in the Western world? These data is based on World Bank figures. True. Third worst poverty. Jesus. The average salary I've mentioned there, 27,000, and look what it is. Australia, New Zealand. And at the bottom, Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Japan. So I want you to remember the top four, USA, Portugal, UK, and Australia, and the bottom four. Sweden has an inequality half that of America. It's 80% better than Britain. Norway is down there. Our poverty is 85% worse than the, <laughs> the British. Finland, 95 And Japan is half our rate of income inequality. Colleagues, I wonder how many of you would have thought that Japan has less inequality than Britain. Surprising. Um, Margaret Thatcher. I want to note I'm quoting Margaret Thatcher with no undiminished pride and uh, delight. She rightly said, because I'm a Yorkshireman, and those, we have some Scots here who we'll know about money. We <laughs> North and Northern people know about brass and money. And she's absolutely right. You can only afford the services you can afford. You know, it's, it's obvious. It's self, it's self, blindly self obvious. The question then is, friends, do we afford health care? money as much as other countries. Again, the USA is top of the league table. In 1980, out of every $100, they gave $9 to health care. In 2008, it's the latest figures we have, is 16%. The average over this 30-year period is 13.2%.
So out of every hundred pounds, the Americans spent 13 pounds, 20 pence on health. Right down at the bottom. Joint equal 19 out of the 21 countries. UK, Spain and Japan on average spent 7.3%. 7.3%. So Germany spends much more. So for every pound we spend on health, the Germans spend £1.32. Portugal. Do you know the basket case, Portugal? They're all being nasty about the Portuguese and the Greeks. The Portuguese spend, for every pound we spend, they spend £1.11. Uh, Greece, £1.06. The Western average is 8.9. Colleagues, we're still below the Western average. Dan. Sorry, you have to be louder. Uh, well, our type of organization is a very good question. I could give you more data on that. For example, the Americans, uh, uh, eight, eight, nearly 80% of their healthcare money goes through the private sector. So too does Greece. But every other country, actually spends more from its taxes in different various forms. But broadly speaking, what a nation spends on health, and this is why the GDP figure, so corruption may be a thing, but in one sense it's the margin. And because we're measuring over time, you more or less take that, that becomes a consistent factor. But please notice where we all are. The Greeks spend more. The Irish spend more, well, the Irish are like us. Uh, not much. But I hate to say anything nice about Tony Blair, apart from he's a war criminal. Um, <laughs> did I say that? I should have said that, yeah. But by the Nuremberg Protocol, he was a war criminal. The Nuremberg Protocol colleagues uh, simply said, Hitler's government waged an aggressive war. But this is no doubt, Bush and Blair together waged an aggressive war. Why should I talk about the war? Um, Dan, no, you're Sam, aren't you? You're Sam. Sam. Today is the 2nd of September. Why should that figure, why should that date be of any significance when I'm talking about war? All right, I'll make it easy for you. <laughs> Yesterday was the 1st of September, and tomorrow, if I live long enough, will be the 3rd of September. Now, what happened once on the 3rd of September? 75 years ago, friend, the Second World War broke out. 75 years ago. So, that will become interesting when we look later on. Because what we were looking at is where nations have come from and where nations are going. Okay, but history lessons, of course, that actually Napoleon and the First, Second World War is about the same, is it? Yeah, I know, I know. In fact, I talked about as an excerpt, madam. I think figures will be really different now because uh, Ireland, Spain, Greece, Germany, Italy, Spain, 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 no, exactly right. Now, your point is very well made because these figures, uh, I, I won't digress too much on this, um, the figures we've published take us to 2008, where Ireland did very, very well, as you'll see. But the latest figures show that Ireland has fallen back. So, of course, these things, things are always moving. But what you are seeing is the main trends. And what we want to focus focus upon, rather nationalistically, is where is the UK and the USA in all this? Uh, child mortality. Again, top of the league table. The Americans, have, this is rates per million of children 0 to 4. It's 1,503. The highest child mortality rate in the Western world is the United States of America under God. How many of you this evening would have thought that you'd be hearing that they've got the worst relative poverty in the Western world and the highest child mortality rate? Indeed, the American national statistics report data on ethnic minority or ethnic groups. So they talk about white Americans, African Americans, Latino Americans, etc. And for every, if you look at just the white American children, they're still the top of the league table. But these figures include blacks. And when I was talking to an American colleague, 
he said to me, it almost sounds like South Africa, but Colin, you've included the left. I said, well, yeah, you know, it's beyond natural sadistic. And I didn't want to embarrass our American friend, because for every white child who died in America, 2.2 black children died. Can you imagine? I mean, inequality is one thing, but how do they get away with it? The next, I'm afraid, are our New Zealand brothers and sisters, and then Colin, Britain. The United Kingdom has the third worst child mortality rate in the Western world. Now, the good news is every country has reduced its child mortality rate over the last 20 years. The Americans down by 53%. That's quite impressive. Let's say good things about, you know, great America, great medicine. The New Zealanders are down 57%. We're down 63%. So if you, and this is always a danger about statistics, if I wanted to be nice about the present government, I could say, oh look, Britain's child mortality rate has fallen by 63%. Colleagues, the only way to look at national statistics is when you compare them with like countries. That's why these politicians can get away with lies, damn lies, and misuse of statistics. See, when you start looking at other countries, we have a reduction of child mortality by 63%, but the average in the rest of the Western world is 69%. I'm ashamed that Britain uh, finds ourselves, colleagues, the Portuguese, the Greeks, you know, let's be honest, we're a little bit, a bit dismissive of our Southern European uh, colleagues in Europe, but, you know, only the New Zealanders and the USA are worse than us. And it may be, we don't know, Talking to a New Zealand colleague, the disproportionate number of deaths in New Zealand might be because of the Maori split. So, as there are black Americans in North America, the Maoris also suffer dis disproportionately, as they do in Australia. Has anybody now, there's a prize here for a drink at half time, can anybody notice anything singular, remarkable about that league table? Uh, no, no, not really, no. Sorry? It goes from island to six. Yeah. Ah, yes, well, we haven't got enough room for the table, though. Sorry. I'm just, yes, you're right, I'm missing some of the countries out. I beg your pardon. Thank you, yes. Sir? There appears to be some correlation between and Ah, but that's, don't pitch me best line. <laughs> that's no good at all, sir, no. You're right, but we'll come back to that in a moment. What else is noticeable? Jamie? Well, it's uh, the top ones are English speaking. Colleagues, the top six bloody countries in the Western world with the highest child mortality rate are all English speaking countries. What are we doing to our kids? As a father and a grandfather, we're not very nice to children, no. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Sweden, proportionately. No, no, no. But why should that matter? No, by the time they're children, this means they're almost by definition going to be second or third generation. And then you've got parents who would not give their child to the doctor because of people's discipline or religion. Ah, if you start breaking it down, you're absolutely right. There's a real problem. For example, we don't know the case in Southampton. Uh, they're Jehovah's Witnesses. And all I'll simply say, theologically, there are a funny lot of the Jehovah's Witnesses. So we don't know why they took the child away. But we do know, for example, that some Jehovah's Witnesses will refuse blood transfusion, and then the court had to come in, etc. Uh, but so, within those figures, you might be right. There may be all sorts of subgroups of them, though. But generally, uh, nationally, the six countries. See, what gets me? Portugal 
as poverty, but it's significantly lower than the Brits. Greece, I mean, you've been to Greece, it's a poor country. So what is it about the Greeks, that what they do to their children? I would suggest to you, there are cultural factors, but not the cultural factors you're suggesting, but literally, how our attitude is to children. Now let's say something nice again about Blair. I've mentioned Margaret Thatcher, who I don't like, positively. I'll mention Blair again. To be fair to Blair, he was the first British Prime Minister to acknowledge that we had got children living in relative poverty worse than what was then the old 15 European, European countries. For the first person to talk about child mortality. If you look at the money that the Blair government, real extra money to the NHS, really proportional big increases, who do you go to? People like me. When I had my cancer 10 years ago, two major ops, six months chemotherapy, etc, etc, I had a fantastic treatment. Because of course, we older people vote. So the, the amount of new monies in the NHS has disproportionately actually gone to adults. Because the adults who are going to be ill are those of us who are over 60 or over 70. Dan. Absolutely, absolutely. But I re repeat, and of course our colleague is absolutely right, the correlation between income inequality and child mortality is massive. And despite the kind of variations within each of these societies, and I take our colleague's point absolutely right, um, yeah, pretty, pretty bluntly, the, people, the kids who die in this country today are working class children. That's the truth. Here in Boscombe, Lower end of the market. Always been the case. The poor have a worse health outcome. There are numerous studies showing that, uh, when looking at kind of clinical studies, that the poor, the lower paid, have a higher death rate of children. And that, there is no doubt. So you'll get variations in each of these societies. But in that sense, the poverty dimension within the society, including Sweden. Sweden, I saw a paper only just recently, even in Equality Sweden, Therefore, their children from poorer families die disproportionately more than the average. But the correlation between income inequality and child mortality, it's irrefutable. Uh, we've been talking about rates. Rates. I sometimes, some of my students have called me the death man. Because if you measure mortality, if you measure bodies, you get some idea of what's happening in society. And sometimes I say to myself, hang on, which of the columns am I going to end up in? But also, I'm talking about dead children. And I go back to what Elizabeth Barakoff said. Nothing, nothing is more bitter than losing a bed. So let's put these into numbers. In the average three years, in 1979-81, we lost an average of 10,289 children. Today, the latest figures we've got, each of these years, we lost 4,217. Oh, by the way, significantly more than 9-11. Okay, 9-11, The Americans used to lose annually nearly 53,000 children. And now it's only nearly 31,000 children. So how big a success story is this? Well, what I want to do is to look at what's happened in the last 20 years. 20 years ago, Greece and Portugal had the highest child mortality rate in the Western world. As seen earlier in the table, they've got a lower one. If we transpose, if we change these rates into numbers, if the UK had the same rate of child deaths as Greece and Portugal, annually, for the last three years, there'd be 1,038 children, fewer grieving families. These are excess deaths. Excess deaths. In the last three years, that means nearly, uh, what I can't do the math without the calculator, 3,100 extra deaths. Deaths we should not expect and clearly linked to poverty. The media response. Sorry, James. <laughs> Shakespeare told you everything there is to know about the media. Shakespeare said, 
Nothing is good or ill, but as thinking, actually, the media makes it so. So the media are going on about the robbery. The, the children who have been sexually mistreated and abused and exploited. Colleagues, the thing they're not talking about is almost 99% of these kids come from poor, disadvantaged families. I'm not blaming parents, I'm blaming intergenerational poverty. Because what's a 12 and 13 year old doing out at 10 and 11 o'clock at night? I guess your kid wouldn't be out at 10 and 11 o'clock at night. But if in fact you've got broken homes, damaged homes, unhappy homes, etc. These children are desperate for attention because, and the poverty dimension is never talked about. But if in fact we compared these 1400 children over 16 year periods, and just take the last three years, we've got 3,114 under five deaths in excess that we should have. That's more than 9-11. Where is the media when you want it? On the other hand, America, under God, and I'm so impressed by that phrase, under God, this very religious Christian country, and Jesus said, suffer the children Come unto me for the kingdom of heaven. You know, of all the religious countries, who knows what Jesus said? Love your neighbor as yourself and forgive your enemies. That's America under God. They had, they had the same rate as Greece and Portugal. 13,600 children. Every year, fewer deaths. At four times the 9-11. It's all the fuss about 9-11. I shouldn't say that, should I? Terrible. Nothing justified 9-11. Nothing justified it. Neither Israeli tanks, artillery, or planes trapping Palestinian villages. Nothing justified it. But chronically in America, 13,000 children died in excess. The same year as 9-11, 14,000 Americans killed each other, four-fifths with guns, 30,000 Americans committed suicide, two-thirds with guns, and 42,000 Americans killed themselves on the road. But the media doesn't want to talk about that. Now, what I hope you're not going to do is blame the NHS. Because don't forget, we've got the lowest, joint lowest funded healthcare system in the Western world. But let's see how effective they were. The Portuguese, for every 1% of GDP they spent, they saved 569 per million deaths. The Greeks, there, the Italians, then the Irish, and we were fifth. We were the fifth most effective country in reducing child mortality based on the money we spent. And Margaret Thatcher is absolutely right. You can only have the services you can afford. The colleagues, we do not afford as much as the people. And I have to tell you, if we were affording as much as Germany and France for the next 10 years, these mortality rates would be hard. And down here, oh, look at America. Oh, the bottom of the league tail for a change. Because as our friend talked, was it you, madam, who talked about corruption? No, it was Dan. Yeah. Of course, the Americans spend 13.2% of their GDP, of which most does not get to the patient. The one thing you can say about the NHS, the money you spend on the patient, apart from the bloody manager, who said that? I didn't say manager. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. My, I'm a frontline worker, you see, in the, Sometimes I don't like managers, I admit it. Uh, but because I'm jealous of their salaries. You know, they do a three year degree, then an MBA, and they earn 200,000 pounds a year. I had eight years training and I'm a mere 70,000. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Absolutely ridiculous. No justice in the world. On the other hand, a footballer, 199,000 pounds a week. Ah, oh, there we are. There. But look at the Americans. And this is the corruption of their health system. This is before the Obama. And of course, most of, a lot of that money doesn't go to uh, the, the patient because it's got to go for profits and your shareholders. I think about you, I don't know about you, I'm breathless. I think I need a drink. <laughs> Shall we stop for 15 minutes? Perfect, perfect. 15 minutes for a drink, please. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, and we're going to crack on with, with part two. Um, thank you all again for coming tonight. And, um, I think the first half has certainly illustrated what I was talking about at the beginning, is how a university needs to be challenging society
and coming up with solutions and looking at things and thinking about what's important for society. So um, I'd say again, for the second half, uh, what we're going to be looking at is a is meaty subject. So uh, and as you've now gathered, um, Professor Pritchard is certainly not afraid to, to, to tell us as it is. Um, so, so we're looking forward very much to the second half. And remember, this is very much about questions and, and, and topics and what you think and what this makes you feel and how you think we should be reacting to this and what you think we should be doing. So please do participate. Without further ado, go ahead. Well, as Jamie says, this is very much... Your part of the, uh, um, the, sem the seminar. Scandal is a word not usually used by academics. We're supposed to be detached. Uh, Olympian. Yes, and even a bit ivory tower. I think it's a scandal of uh, the excess deaths in British children. We have the third worst relative poverty. I think that's a scandal. You know, we have politicians who are saying we're all in together. We have politicians who say there's no such thing as a class society. I don't know where they're living. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> in every sense of that word, Westminster. Britain has the third highest child mortality, third worst poverty. Incredible. And we do not afford as much as other people. And I'm saying here, don't blame the NHS. It really isn't the NHS. Are British children doubly disadvantaged? That was the question I posed. Are we doubly disadvantaged, our children? No. We're trebly disadvantaged. We have children living in relative poverty. And the impact of that, of course, we've known for years, clinical studies have shown again and again and again, children from the wrong end of the socioeconomic scale die disproportionately more than more established people. Money to spend? Not at all. We do not spend as much as others. And the new monies that went into NHS disproportionately went to my generation. Now, it's not that I don't want my generation to be looked after. I want to be, have equal share and waiting for our children. So the question is, who is to blame? What do you think? And I'll quote you, if you notice my Methodist background, I love to quote the Bible and Shakespeare, and here's one of my great, greatest, the only decent Christian religion group, the Quakers. And William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, said, it is a, what well, he says, it's a reproach to government and religion to suffer such poverty and excess. So, colleagues, who's to blame? The floor is yours. That I couldn't tell you. One, the difficulty with this, this uh, termination of under 23 weeks is a massive, massive problem. The one thing you can say, generally, is by choosing these 21 Western world countries, the quality of the science and medicine in all these countries is more or less the same. Um, those of us who are in this field doing research will be using papers from Portugal, Greece, uh, Ireland, Sweden, Japan, Western, Western world medicine is more or less the same everywhere. So 
So you will get this variation. So where you're getting 23 weeks, for example, in, in Ireland, you will definitely get 23 weeks because, of course, they don't get remotely like uh, anything like termination. And indeed, you can see this because Portugal and Greece came late. Sorry, Portugal and Ireland came late to family planning. And you, you, the impact of that is still seen in they have a disproportionately high rate of young women committing suicide. And of course, in Ireland, virtually in practical terms, there is no termination of pregnancy in practical terms. So you will get these variations, but when you're looking at the 21 Western countries, the kind of quality of medicine and the science is more or less now universal. So those features will affect, but not disproportionately. It wouldn't account too much. Yeah. Loud and clear, please, Dad. Uh, <laughs> well, of course, newspapers are very interesting. Um, I, Jamie, James Donald, quite likes me occasionally because some of the work I do gets interested, gets the media interested. But I go back to the lies, damn lies, and politicians who misuse statistics, and nothing is good or ill that the media makes it so. Um, Four years ago now, we did a survey in this city, in the whole of South Coast, on the behavior of adolescent children, uh, 12 to 16. And we, we measured them in 2008. And we compared it with a study we'd done 20 years before in 1988. And this may surprise you, I thought it's your kids. Actually, it's your children I'm talking about, your teenagers. Um, children of, in 2008, were actually better behaved than they were in 1988. The one problem was the girls started behaving more like the boys. Why do you women want to behave like boys? I don't know. You should teach us to behave like you and more civilized. So girls now are not quite fighting quite as much. The girls are smoking more. But the point of the story was the Times ran half a page in page two of the story and said adolescents better behave. And they did this after reading the research paper and interviewing me after about an hour and a half. The Daily Mail ran me, and they also saw the paper, and they also had this long interview of wanting to clarify items in the paper. What, did, what was their headline? Also on page two, Girls Out of Sex Control. Um, the Independent um, is the second best paper. The Guardian, it has a slant. The only thing really wrong with the, the independent, because it lasts a slant, it's a bit boring. But I'm going to say something to ruin everybody that evening. I've come to the conclusion that the only people who should be allowed to vote are people who read The Times, Telegraph, Independent or Guardian, listen to Radio 4, listen to Classic FM or Radio 3. Because the rest of the stuff, most of the stuff in the newspapers are frankly rubbish and massively questionable. And... Um, Last year we did a paper, which if ever I'm invited back again, I will share with you about the impact of multiple pollution on your health. On your health. Sperm counts for the young men. Cancers for we older people. Neurological disease and dementias for the slightly older people. Uh, respiratory diseases for people with asthma, etc., etc. And we showed a big problem. And the Daily Mail took it up. And they were sensational. No doubt about it. it was sensational. And the NHS website, which I don't pretend to understand, took the Daily Mail to task and said, you're being sensational. And they were sensational. And then they looked at the research we'd done and didn't have one word of criticism at all. I thought, well, that's very nice, because, you know, no research is perfect. You can always ask the question from a different angle. And I thought, that's interesting. And they're saying how good the research was and sound, etc. But the Daily Mail had sensationalized it. Then I suddenly realized, colleagues, the key finding was that dementia deaths are starting 10 years earlier in the Western world. And that's a finding that frightens me. So suddenly you realize that government organizations might want to present not just so much the independent or what have you, but government organizations now are hugely questionable. And they'll only give you sometimes half the truth. 
And one of the difficulties of being an academic, see, nobody gives me any research money at all. Bournemouth University are remarkable. They're still paying me. And I haven't had any research money for the last 10 years. Not, not quite true. Eight years. Because I'm asking questions that nobody wants paying to have answered. And that's one of the great problems. Where do we get the free, challenging inquiry? And that, I'm afraid, is true for successive governments. Madam, um, why not? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, I told you that my students call me the deaf man. So, you know, some of the things I look at is really miserable. So I keep smiling, etc. Otherwise, it would be really quite grim. Um, I used to be in child psychiatry. Uh, I spent 15 years in child psychiatry. Okay, way back in the 60s. And I used to work for the then largest county council in England. That was the West Riding of Yorkshire, where young Dan comes from. And I covered all the four big clinics in child psychiatry. And we used to have about two or three children a year, which we used to call minimal cerebral dysfunction. These kids would be fidgeting, twitching, couldn't concentrate, what's going on, couldn't string a sentence together, kind of irritable. We now call it ADHD, uh, Attention Deficit Hyper Hyperactivity Disorder. When we called it minimal cerebral dysfunction, I found the first paper internationally in 19... I'm glad you asked this question, I can talk me down now, you see. Uh, in 1968, we found the first paper published on minimal cerebral dysfunction, which we now call ADHD. By 1978, okay, before you were born, we got 100 papers published in the International Medical Journal. The last year I looked at this was 2013, in the last six months of 2013, there were 850 papers alone published on ADHD. This is what's happened. I did some work on neuro neurology, and I was asked by an organization called uh, British Ecology Society and to have to give this paper. And I went along to them, and the president, it's a small group of medics, and the first thing the president said was, well, everybody thinks we're cranks. Now, normally, cranks don't admit or recognise they might be a bit cranky. Some people have called me a crank. I couldn't believe it. Anyway, <laughs> um, I am a bit cranky. Uh, I said, well, why? What is it? We're all physicians, consultants or general practitioners, who've been in the business for 20 or more years. And we're all realising that we're patients are different now. We're getting mixed syndrome. So children are developing allergic diseases and asthma levels when I was in child psychiatry, it was point, we had one in a thousand kids with childhood asthma. You'd look at Mrs. Smith, it was usually a boy, say, Mrs. Smith, he will grow out of it. 99% of the time, he did. We've now got 10% of school children, secondary school children, carry an inhaler. It, it's all going crazy. But that's another lecture. Miss, you... No, um, now, that gets very interesting. My generation is probably the healthiest we've been. The baby boomers that were born after the war, I was born before the Second World War, Second World War, because, uh, uh, you know, some of them count, count. I may be, well, I used to do black hair, you know. Yeah. Um, we had, working class children, had orange juice, powdered eggs, and vitamin C and cod liver oil through the winter. I remember as a boy, the old, you, you knew what time of year it was by the food you ate. You only had tomatoes from June to about September. You never had tomatoes at any time. You had, uh, you had oranges at Christmas uh, and things like this. And of course we had minimal diet. So if we hadn't died of the infected diseases, because I belong to a generation where a child died, two or three kids died every term. That was our norm. Before the NHS, my schoolfellows died. A 
friend of mine, Kenny Perrin. I always remember Kenny because he stuck up for me. Bless him, he was 13. He died of septicemia from perforated appendix. That could almost never happen today. So people of my generation who survived are relatively speaking, despite the cancer, reasonably healthy. Whether your children now with their uh, obesity, etc., uh, I don't know. But then you see, we don't have the level of infections. So it's, and again, all I can say is 20 years ago, 10,000 kids a year died in Britain. Now it's only 4,500. So the, I think they responded to something, frankly, in the environment, not their basic health. I no no no. There's this. There is no doubt. See, fat kids didn't exist. We had one fat boy in my school. We called him Juicy Bellwood. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. I remember Juicy so well. But we called him fat. But you wouldn't call him fat today. I, I mean, what? I w went on holiday with my grandson a week. And we had a wonderful week, best w week of the year, weather-wise, in Lyme Regis. And I got a bit disturbed seeing kids of my grandson's age, seven and a half, um, with a little belly. I mean, frankly, I see young men with beer bellies, and, you know, knowing how recent my youth was. You know, and now I've no longer, I've got a little bit of a, a bulge where it used to be. Or rather, because it's really where they did the cancer, you see. They, they put it up. It's not as bad as it should be. You know, joking apart. All you have to do, if you go to Paris, you, you don't need to speak to people. You can tell the Americans and the British they're the fatty. We have a massive problem. I mean, you, each of our hospitals now have got to have a major handling. I mean, an 18 stoner is not unusual. And of course, they're going to have... Yeah, it's pretty obvious. They keep talking about... People get to 100, etc., and theoretically we could live to 120, 130, theoretically with modern science. Uh, but not if uh, we have the kind of diet people are managing. The good thing is, of course, they've reduced the smoking. And of course, smoking, and hopefully none of you, because if you are smoking, then you've been addicted. Because do you realize the tobacco companies deliberately put in chemicals to make tobacco more addictive? Why they haven't been charged, you know, they only pay a fine of billions. No, none of them have gone to prison. They've murdered more kids than, than uh, John P. Sutcliffe at the Yorkshire River. Again, but this is capitalism for you, isn't it? Yeah, it might be a question for you, but if mortality rates we have, if you say we're connected to poverty, then what's the That's a very good question. Yeah. Well, that's a very interesting question. What we have done, we haven't looked at Britain, because that would be too parochial, if you like. What we have done, we said, which of the countries now with the lowest death rate, you know, which has the biggest improvement, which is Greece and Portugal, and which has had the worst improvement, that's the Americans. So we did exactly what you said. Now, you've no idea how tedious a, a set of mortality statistics when you break them down by different diseases. There's something like, I think it's 68 broad categories of diseases. And that means you have to break these numbers down for each of these two countries. But we have done it just for Greece and Portugal compared with the USA. And your point is extremely well taken. Why we got the poverty link is because it's respiratory diseases, liver and kidney, which is odd, and the cancers. So there are about 15... Ignoring the Americans kill their children, you know, because of mortality, child abuse, they've got one of the worst, they have got the highest rate of child abuse deaths in the Western world. You know, the, again, the Americans are at the top of the league table. You know, why anybody wants to say that the Americans compete as much as a nation, I don't know. But anyway, uh, it looks as if, when we looked at Portugal, Portugal and Greece and compare them with American children, the American children were dying of diseases more often related to poverty. So, 
to take each of those countries separately. Perhaps I should do it. I could teach you to do it. And I'm very happy you to come and work for me and do it. And we could publish the paper together. <laughs> no, sorry, no, I can't say independent. No, no, you just make it interesting and dull. I'll make it, I'll start to do that. Oh, yeah. The co colleagues, I could. Let's say nice things about the NHS. Professor Thomas Hickish and I did a paper last year in British Journal of Cancer. Um, the present government did not like it at all because we were exposing their lies. A man called, whose name escapes me because I can't bear to think of it, the, <laughs> the first Secretary of State for Health who started the Health and Social Care Bill. In his white paper of, um, what was it, Modern case, uh, Cancer Care, our ambition, he says, is to reduce cancer deaths for people under 74. Because you know, brothers and sisters, you're going to die of summer. Right? Okay. Uh, so let's reduce cancer deaths, if you like, feasible deaths for under 74. He already knew, we published a paper in 2011, that the cancer deaths in Britain had come right down, and then we were the second biggest reduction of cancer deaths in the Western world. Thomas and I are just publishing a paper later this year to show that the U UK's cancer deaths have never been lower. We are the second biggest reduction. The problem is, colleagues, is why has, got, why has Britain got such a high cancer rate in the first place? It has to, is it genetics? Or is it environment? It's a bit of both, and mainly environment. But the NHS is doing remarkable things. Yeah, I'll just give you a personal example, and I always tell to students, the, the weakest evidence is personal experience. But I was in America for the first Obama election, and the American Republican Party had gone mad about the NHS and talked about socialized medicine. And I was giving a paper to 300 mainly Americans, and um, they didn't like the message, namely, you've got the worst child abuse related deaths in the Western world. So they were silent. And they were so silent after the paper, it was embarrassing. And I thought, oh gosh, you know, have I been speaking English? Um, and the president said, well, have you no questions for the professor? So one person said, you're NHS. You've got committees that decide who lives and dies. Somebody else said, yes, you've got this socialised medicine. And you had this sudden cry of how bad our NHS was. And I was staggered by this. I said, well, hang on. I said, uh, wait a minute, have you used it? I said, well, yes, yes. So I'll update the figures. I said, um, I had two major operations for cancer, six months chemotherapy, and three lots of investigative follow-up uh, investigation colonoscopy, and you don't, know what, you don't want to know what a colonoscopy is. Particularly if you're, you're, you're alert and watching the camera. That's another story. Um, and I said, yes, well, how much did it cost you? I said, I'm glad you asked me that question. My family were rather disappointed. It cost them, in your money, over £100 for car parking fees. And of course, the Americans know nothing about irony. And they just looked at me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm the chief laugh. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I pointed out that unless the present government totally make a mess of it, and they are making a mess of it, um, the NHS will be there when I need it next. And I won't have to worry too much about it. Uh, the NHS, colleagues, is a remarkable, a remarkable. And, most, and of course we make mistakes. We're human. I've lost patience. When, with hindsight, I could have done something better, and there wouldn't have been a suicide. Those poor people I've lost in my career, yeah, I still think about it. On the other hand, I like to think I've got lots of cases which went very well, and changed lives and improved lives, etc. And most of the time, you see, we talked about the NHS. What makes me so angry? None of these politicians, not even Labour, will t remind people that we are still the lowest funders. The biggest problem with the NHS is not managers, actually they're really quite good. They get paid much and they're a bit too arrogant, but really they're quite good. The biggest problem with the NHS is compared with other Western countries, we don't spend, them up, spend them as much. And that is your real difficulty. And when you start thinking of, I can give you lots of examples of the NHS where 
people go the extra mile. But they're getting demoralized. Because, of course, all you, the media does is let's knock the NHS. This is why, believe it or not, we started this idea of comparing. So when anybody complains about the NHS, say, OK, what's it like in other countries? And the Americans, I tell you this, we middle class get an incredible service from our education and healthcare system. Both the education and health, compared with other Western countries, we get it on the cheap. I better not go on anymore, it would be too political. <coughs> Well, uh, as, as um, Beck, Becky said, with the, uh, um, with the obesity, see, one of our colleagues said something really important earlier. Poverty impacts upon child death because the children are at their weakest. So if we looked at the figures for under one year, we talked here about um, 4,000, but something like more than half of those children were under one. Because children die in that first year of life when their, their immune system and everything else is most vulnerable. And this is where poverty kicks in. Because a, a poorer family is, is less educated very often, and less likely to use uh, antenatal care, postnatal care. So it's a very nasty knock-on effect. Um, once you get past four, the death rate drops remarkably. Really quite remarkably. This is why I haven't given you a death rate for 0 to 14. Because those figures then would be literally halved. Because once you look at the uh, children, not a 14, we've got nearly 11 million kids in Britain. Um, it would be under 5,000 deaths. So the, the ratio would have come right down. The big problem is the obesity problems won't begin to affect until probably in their early 30s. Now, one of the things, <coughs> I take some credit here, we looked at drinking levels and uh, early... Uh, liver disease, to find that our young people, binge drinking, etc., had virtually an epidemic compared to other Western countries, particularly European co uh, continental countries, with related to uh, alcohol-related deaths. So where you're smoking and drinking, sorry about the purity coming out of me, this is your problem. So if you're smoking, drinking, and obese, this is where the figures, I think, in 10, 15 years, not the children, unless, of course, you have women delivering who sometimes uh, have damage, give the kids um, diabetes and everything else and so forth. So the, they will change, but generally speaking, treatments are getting better and better. And the cancer, somebody mentioned about the cancer for kids, it's been a remarkable, remarkable reduction. I mean, we were losing, I can't remember the figures now offhand, but I think we've reduced... For example, childhood leukemia is down to about a quarter of what it was only 20 years ago. So if the science keeps going well and we improve and maintain the environment and get people to live sensible lifestyles, then theoretically we could live, you could live to 120, 130, if you want to. <laughs> Well, you see, I think, let me be overtly critical. What I think there should be a, de a public debate on is let's simply take the Margaret Thatcher thesis you can only have the services you can afford. I can't disagree with that. But I simply, I'd, I'd want to remind the British public, because this I am convinced if the general public heard what you've heard tonight, they would be willing to put a penny of tuppence on income tax for our NHS. The general public, 87% of them, say the NHS service we had was very good to excellent. They know it's good. What they don't realise is it's good in face of adversity and literally dishonest governments, successive governments, who are not giving as much as other Western countries. And I, I, should we be giving less than the Greeks and the Portuguese? You know, I mean, it, it's crazy. Because, you know, it's not very hard 
No, no, it's quite good. Any social workers here by any chance? No social workers here. Uh, my daughter works in child protection in London. Um, she's done it now for 15 years. I don't know how she cope. Generally, don't know how she cope. Um, some of the stories she's told me could be talked about in here in Boston. Anything is bad. Anything that's bad in London is as bad here in Bournemouth. Only we hide it. This is a rich society, a rich country, and we hide our poor. It's actually tougher to be poor and living in Bournemouth than it is in London, inner city London, Manchester, Liverpool or Leeds. We have made our poor in this, in this area, this whole region, invisible. One of the great tragedies is the prevention, the psychosocial prevention, is essential. But of course, they don't get it. And it is this intergenerational knock-on effect. The, the, the mother who had a baby who didn't go to prenatal classes, antenatal classes, etc. You know, she's got all sorts of disadvantages. The last government, and compounded by this government, stopped the health visitors, suddenly realised, oh my goodness, we need health visitors. But of course, the biggest, well, another scandal, is that the cuts to local authorities and social services are getting minimal. And what I'd love to see is not just an integration of health and social care, health, social care and education. Well, yeah, because it's a pity my friend's not here, um, Richard Williams, who worked in a, a major school here in, in Bournemouth, who brought together education and social services in his secondary school. And the results were remarkable. They, they reduced the level of truancy, drug misuse, etc. And they literally changed the school. And it was really a social worker approach, plus their, their, their college teacher colleagues. And I remember one teacher who wasn't very favourable to the idea, the ideology, she said, you know, you're, you're supporting your, ex, you know, you're being nice, effective parent. But he said, she said, at least you've got the effective parents off my back and now I can teach and do a good job. Prevention is always, and of course prevention services are being cut to the bone. Cut to the bone. And of course, again, you see, I know I'm, let's say something nice for social services. You've heard some surprising statistics tonight. If I said to you, baby Peter Connolly, uh, Victoria Climberley, and say, what do you think of British child protection? You'd probably say, rubbish. Yes? The child abuse related deaths in Britain have never been lower since records began. I, I want to get angry with you. See, the, the media have a theme and you can't challenge it. The evidence is overwhelming. We used to be the fourth highest child killer in the Western world in the 70s. Because we're not nice to kids. As a society, we're not nice to children. I've been kicked out of pubs with my daughter at age six months on my back. You can't bring a child in, in, into a pub, etc. Uh, I mean, you know, we're just not nice to kids. The, we're now fourth lowest with the child abuse related deaths. Most of those, and this is where some people get a bit itchy because of the political correct, correctness, we know who kills children. 
no, no, we know who neglect children, and that's poverty. The big dimension is poverty. The ones who then kill children, the mentally ill, the psychopaths, and the fecklers. But these numbers are so small. Compared with child abuse-related deaths, you in this room, as motorists, kill far, far more kids. And nobody wants to talk about that. And baby P is six years ago. The media have to take these rare, exceptional cases and parade it before you. Colin Pritchard. Quite agree. Because a lot of those, and the baby two cases, one of them, the drugs and alcohol Can I say this? I don't know what political party stands for, it doesn't matter. Every political party would agree with you, let's do something about drug and alcohol abuse. UKIP, Greens, Labour, the Conservatives, they'd all agree with you. Only two parties might want to talk about poverty. And it's so much easier, you see, it's almost a puritanical thing, it's drugs and... Why do people get into drugs and, uh, and, uh, and alcohol and smoking, etc.? Because their lives are so miserable, etc., and they're down at the bottom. This is the problem. The poverty, you're quite right, it's linked to drugs and alcohol most of the time, unless they have a genetic predisposition. The problem, and now I'm a hard liner on this, the problem is, and I, I, I disagree with most of my social work colleagues, because my social work colleagues agree with me on this. The vast majority of parents, the vast majority of parents who are poor, love their kids. They want the best for their kids. But at that time in their lives, in my view, they're not able to meet the needs the child needs in that time. And our modern neuroscience is now telling us, not the first three years, but that first year is so desperately important. Now, I, I would actually advocate earlier removal, and I'm pretty hard on that, but my colleagues say, Oh, but Colin, that's all very well, but where are we going to put them? Because they don't have alternatives. And this is where successive governments refuse to look at the long-term knock-on effect. The children we exclude from school today, I can almost define them without ever meeting them. And nine out of ten of these kids who come from ex who are excluded from school, dad's not working, and they've a long-term poverty. And they've got intergenerational types of poverty. Whereas we know it, we can reach children in school, but that means extra resources at that moment in time. We would be saving literally billions if we had an integrated service so that when a woman gets in, starts getting into trouble, we could appeal to the undoubted love she has for that kid and actually go in positively. But in my view, there'd have to be alternatives or we take away earlier. And dare I say it, better family planning. Because very often the reality, and this is not very PC, the reality is, you and I might manage two or even three kids. But to manage four children, you've got to be a minor genius. 
And if you don't have a steady income and steady relationships, you're gonna, kids are going to suffer. So to me, I go back to it. I'd love to see an integration of health, social care, and education. But the danger is, if you don't mind saying so, it's ever so we feel drugs or alcohol. My medical colleagues have got the same problem. They're all saying, oh, look at the liver disease. Oh, look at the neurology. Look at the cancer. And not any of these men, apart from a few of us, are pulling these two things together and saying, what have these disparate diseases got in common? And the answer is the environment. And if you want me to come back and really scare you, I'll come back and talk to you about the environment and what's happening to your health. Brilliant. leaves me to make three quick thank yous. Uh, the first one is, most importantly, to all you to coming and to taking part and joining in the debate. Uh, the second one, I've got the third already, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> the second one is to uh, Kathy Moskima over for hosting us and for their kindness and generosity and, and everything. Um, and the third one, I've remembered it, is to Professor Colin Pritchard. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you for supper. <laughs>